Impact of non-pharmaceutical interventions to reduce COVID-19 mortality and healthcare demand. Essentially, what can we do about this without medicine? This is social distancing, this is quarantine, isolation, things of that nature. Now, I'd like to take a moment just to talk about uh, scientific papers in general. Papers are usually written to have an abstract that summarizes the paper up front. Um, something I like to do that might seem odd at first is read the abstract last, because it tends to say something about the results and conclusions of the paper, which might paint your perception of the data. Um, so we'll be starting with the introduction, not the abstract. And in fact, I won't be reading it at all, as it is mostly redundant with um, the content of the video. Further, I will not be reading the whole paper in the video, but I will be highlighting key sentences and summarizing the pieces I do not go over explicitly. The link to the paper is in the description. With the introduction, the introduction exists to provide context to everything that's happening. The materials and methods section explains how the study was carried out. The results section is just that, it's what they found. And the discussion is where the authors of the paper interpret the results, although in this paper the results and discussion are very similar. The discussion I found didn't add all that much. You'll note that I, uh, towards the end of the video, ended up wrapping the results and discussions in one together. Now they open this paper with some interesting statistics. As of March 16th, we have 164,837 cases and 6,470 deaths across 146 countries. Remember, confirmed cases will always be a smaller number than actual cases because to be confirmed you need to be tested and test kits are rather limited at the moment. Uh, just something to keep in mind in the context of projections for future infections. They say that this is comparable to the H1N1 outbreak of 1918. Uh, I don't know about you, but I wasn't around for that. I don't think you were either. And that reducing contact among people by closing gathering places, among other of these non-pharmaceutical interventions, from now on referred to as NPIs, was effective, and it should continue to be effective in situations like right now. Notably, stopping these practices allows the disease to rebound, which, uh, you know, we don't want. They outlined two strategies, both with the aim to reduce the reproductive number. Before getting into what those strategies are, let's define that phrase. Basically, the effective reproductive number, R, is how many other people a sick person infects on average in a real-life situation. Contrast this with R0, the basic reproductive number, which assumes everyone is at risk and is used in modeling. You know, these models make a basic assumption that says that things are worse in the model than they could be in real life, because some people are immune, some people don't really get affected at all. Strategy A, suppression, is the more extreme of the two, and it aims to take that number below 1, meaning that the number of cases would decline over time. Over 1 denotes an increase, under 1 denotes a decrease. This is what China, for example, is doing. Over time, the virus would go away in this scenario. Further, vaccines are being developed. Really, the difficult part here is waiting. The authors suggest 12 to 18 months before a vaccine is available, and maintaining an extreme measure that long, even with occasional breaks which they suggest should be possible, could be problematic. It's a hard pill to swallow, if nothing else. Strategy B is mitigation. By slowing the spread through similar but less extreme means, mitigation intends to build immunity in the population over time at what is hopefully a manageable rate for healthcare systems. The key difference between the two strategies is that, unlike suppression, which hopes to immediately start a decrease in cases, mitigation sees that as more of an end goal, and instead focuses on reducing the rate of increase to something more reasonable. If you've heard of flattening the curve, that's what they mean. Importantly, they don't really consider the ethical and economic aspects of these strategies, and they note the human factor, which is to say, people don't really do what they're told. They approach the problem pragmatically, by taking existing healthcare systems, the United States and Great Britain, for their models. They believe that this should apply to comparably high-income countries. Now, if you don't mind my saying, this model is really cool. It takes census data, data on classrooms, commutes, workspaces, etc., to simulate how people travel and gather. It's a modified version of a model used in pandemic influenza planning, which is a great use of existing resources, I think. I mean, I just love this stuff, so... That aside, if you'd like to skip the summary of the details of the model, go to the timestamp on screen or in the description. If not, let's go over the assumptions they make in their model. 
first, they assume that about a third of transmission occurs within the household, a third in schools and work, and a third elsewhere in the community. To break down why those numbers come out so cleanly, it makes sense to think about how intimately you interact with people in different places and how many people there are. Typically, those two factors are inversely proportional, which is to say, as one goes up, the other goes down. At home, we hug and share eating spaces and sit and sleep near each other for hours on end, but that's only with a few people. In school and work, we only shake hands and talk and maybe eat together, but with dozens of people. Out at grocery stores, or, you know, waiting in line for food, we might see hundreds of people, but we don't actually interact with them all that much. In the end, those all balance out. The virus itself, they assume it incubates for about five days. Incubation is the time the virus is just sitting in your body, reproducing, at a low enough level that you don't really feel anything. About four and a half days into this incubation, you hit a point where you become infectious, but you still don't feel sick. Meaning there's about half a day where people are infectious, but they just don't know it yet. Again, these are assumptions, not facts, and even though they are probably close to the true values, they're just averages. Everyone will experience this differently. Again, we see Arnot come up, and they estimate it to be about 2.4, although they go anywhere from 2 to 2.6 in their models. Meaning that every one person who gets infected is predicted to infect at least two others under this model. They also assume that symptomatic people are about 50% more infectious than asymptomatic ones. Coughing is one of the telltale signs of this disease, and it is also a great way to spread disease. Therefore, someone without a cough, even though they are infectious, is potentially less infectious. They further make allowance for variance in infectiousness, and they assume that a recently infected person will not be able to contract the same strain soon after getting over the disease. They have an immunity to it. The starting conditions of the disease were set so that the data we do have about infections and deaths fit into the model nicely. The next model is to do with uh, hospital utilization. So they assume that two-thirds of cases will result in self-isolation within a day of symptoms showing, and that hospitalization, if necessary, will result five days after that. The age data on screen is based on China's experience with the disease and modified for Britain and the United States model. Hospitalization, likelihood of critical condition, and death all increase with age, especially once we get into the 50s and 60s. 30% of those hospitalized end up in critical care under this model, and about half of those people will die. Those who do not require critical care die at a rate depending on their age. Again, older is worse in this case. A normal hospitalization results in an 8-day stay, where a critical case is double that at 16 days, with 10 of those days spent in the intensive care unit. Given their other assumptions, this means an average 10.4-day stay, which is close to real-world numbers, although they note that it's a little lower. This is significant because overwhelming our hospitals is a surefire way to increase the number of otherwise preventable deaths during the outbreak. Now, for the NPIs themselves, the thing that this paper seemed to focus so heavily on in the title, they take five types and implement them separately and in conjunction with each other. Notably, they err on the side of caution and suggest a more pessimistic outlook on how effective each policy will be. Again, people do not like being told what to do. Now, they've provided us with a table outlining each policy and what it means. Let's take a look. Case isolation in the home. When you know you have it, you stay home. Voluntary quarantine. When someone in your house has it, you all stay home. These two fall into the category of always on, meaning that there is no trigger to turn them on. They're on by default. Social distancing for 70 and up, as well as social distancing for all. Avoiding gatherings, physically standing farther from people, etc. It involves a lot of staying home. Closure of schools. This will prove effective in limiting contact among younger people. These measures are triggered, meaning that the government will under a condition like number of intensive care unit cases in a week, which is what they use in their model, will turn them on. The through line here is that staying home and away from other people is the most effective strategy. The model assumes not everyone complies and that while staying home reduces infection risk from external sources, it increases spread among those in the same household. The specific difference between mitigation and suppression here involves time scale. Mitigation being a couple months shorter, with special considerations for the elderly. Now, if you skipped ahead to this point, they did a good job with the setup modeling in terms of 
uh, how the disease spreads, how hospitals will be impacted, and how NPIs, isolation, quarantine, social distancing, and closure of schools apply. The results section will heavily rely on diagrams, so feel free to pause if you need to take a closer look. The first thing they did was create a baseline where no action is taken. Comparing Britain and the US, Britain has an older, closer population, meaning their daily deaths curve progresses faster and peaks at a higher number because their population is on average more vulnerable. Note that this is about percentages of the population, not total numbers. The totals in the top right indicate a much greater death toll in the US. These curves do not account for the healthcare system being overwhelmed. This other diagram is deaths by state, and it kind of just looks like a mess, honestly, but it highlights an underlying point. This is a different level of threat in different places. You see the state all the way on the left there, huge peak very early on, states toward the right, smaller peak, more even spread out. So next, we have a series of curve comparisons with different mitigation strategies implemented over a three-month period. For the sake of expediency, we'll look at only the worst and best case scenarios, as well as only the Great Britain data. Just know that other combinations of factors are considered middle of the road. If we do nothing, we outstrip hospitals capacity horribly. Demand is 30 times greater than supply. Even the best case scenario for mitigation results in a peak demand eight times greater than what could be met. There's a chart that accompanies these data as well, but it's a bit unintuitive and doesn't add much to the discussion. It's available to you in the PDF if you really want to see it, and again, that is in the description. Looking at suppression, we see again the do-nothing option as a baseline, and the ultimate combination of school closure, case isolation, household quarantine, and population-wide social distancing over the course of five months. Now, if you look to the right half of the graph, you see a peak that actually goes higher than the do-nothing scenario. This is because once the suppression ends, few people have gotten sick and built any sort of immunity to the virus, meaning that the population at large is still very vulnerable. Their solution is an adaptive strategy involving not a single five-month-long suppression period, but a series of suppression periods, the first being the most intense because that's when the outbreak will be most intense due to a lack of immediate response. This variable strategy can be implemented on a more local level, the level of the state in the US, for example. In Great Britain, they estimate that two-thirds of the time leading up to a vaccine being developed will be spent social distancing. The on-off trigger in the model is a number of weekly ICU cases. For example, it would be 100 to turn it on and 50 to turn it off. Once it rises to 100, we enter into this hardcore, uh, nobody goes anywhere, social distancing mode. And then after it drops down to below 50, we can revert to business as usual. This is what they suggest would be the preferred strategy for dealing with the epidemic. And that is pretty much the entire paper put into uh, digestible terms. If you have any questions, I can answer them in the comments below. Um, of course, you can always read the paper yourself, too, if you're feeling up to it. Again, there are some bits I left out, but just because they were technical and didn't really bring much to the conclusions drawn from the paper. For example, detailing the differences in what the threshold is for that on-off trigger in their model. I didn't really think that was necessary to go through, um, saying, like, this is what it would be like if the th trigger is 60, this is what it's at 100 and 200, etc. I didn't feel like that was necessary, it didn't really add much to the discussion, um, but it is interesting nonetheless to take a look at the data if you're into that sort of thing. Regardless, I hope this video was helpful, I hope that you'll come back for more content, maybe like this, probably not. I, uh, I did enjoy this, but I feel like I still want to do the sort of comic dubbing that I was doing five or six years ago. Um, but we'll, we'll see where this takes us. You know, I'm open to new ideas. All right. Thank you for watching and I hope you have a good day.